This exhibition and its catalog um, comprise the first major U.S. survey of Alex South's career, covering the past 15 years of his work. This is a project about America and about South's process of wandering within it, allowing one encounter to lead to the next through serendipity, free association, a tenacious curiosity, and an incredible eye for finding out how powerful and beautiful overlooked people and places can be. As those of you who have just seen the film know, uh, the often indelible images you will see in the show would of course not exist without the expeditions on which his subjects were found. Yet, as Soth has noted, the photograph does its job at stopping time, but mostly is a charming reminder of the hunt. We hope the work you see in the galleries upstairs compellingly relay the narrative of these journeys. Um, it's an exhibition of over 100 photographs that examine Soth's major bodies of work, as well as numerous projects along the way, uh, charting subjects ranging from the working class taverns of Minneapolis, to the motel rooms of Niagara Falls, to the forest and desert communities of individuals seeking a life off the grid. In the two years during which this exhibition was under development, Soth has been dramatically expanding his practice sampling new equipment, creating a constellation of online and moving images and web material, um, and actively continuing his activities in self-publishing. As a result, over one third of this show represents new work, uh, not exhibited until now, and we're thrilled to be able to debut this in our galleries. So now to our speakers. Um, Alex Soth, as many of you know, um, was born and raised in the Twin Cities. His photographs have been featured in numerous solo and group exhibitions, including the 2004 Whitney and Sao Paulo Biennales. Um, in 2008, a large survey exhibition of his work was exhibited at the Jeux de Pomme in Paris and at the Photo Museum Winterthur in Switzerland. His first major book of photographs, Sleeping by the Mississippi, was published by Steidel in 2004 to critical acclaim. Since then, he has published Niagara in 2006, Fashion Magazine 2007, Dog Days Bogota also 2007, The Last Days of W in 2008, and the soon to be released Broken Manual, a new publication with Steidel that is featured um, as part of a body of work in the gallery of the same name. He's been busy. Um, in 2008, South also started his publishing company, Little Brown Mushroom, um, and continues to manage an active blog, which I would encourage you to visit. Um, Soth is a, a member of Magnum Photos, a distinguished international cooperative. In New York, he's represented by the Gagosian Gallery, and here in Minneapolis, he is represented by Weinstein Gallery at 46th and Bryant, uh, which is about to open a show I'd highly recommend that you see called Portraits 100 Years, August Sander, Robert Maplethorpe, and Alex Soth. Soth is the recipient of several major fellowships um, from the Bush, McKnight, and Jerome Foundations, and was awarded the 2003 Santa Fe Prize for Photography. His work is represented in major public and private collections, including the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and of course, the Walker. Um, George Slade uh, is also a Minnesota native and is currently the curator at the Photographic Resource Center at Boston University. Slade is a former artistic director of the Minnesota Center for Photography, where he developed and implemented all of the center's exhibitions and public programs. He also served as program director for the McKnight Artist Fellowships for Photographers. He has also served as an adjunct instructor at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, an adjunct at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, where he served as coordinating curator for Friedlander, the 2005 traveling retrospective of Lee Friedlander, um, organized by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And George has written extensively on contemporary photography in print and online, um, including his very active blog, Rephotographica. Did I pronounce that or say that correctly? Um, George is a photographic archivist at heart and has a long history with Alex Soth, which I think will become evident in their conversation this afternoon. He, opens, he also happens to have an illustrious history here uh, of working at the Walker in the early to mid 1990s, where he helped manage the museum's library and build its stellar collection of photography books. Um, between stints as an individual independent curator for spaces such as Parts Photographic Arts. He's also been very active um, as a writer on photography during that period as well. So it's a great pleasure to have George back in our midst for today's conversation with Alec. Um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage Alec Soth and George Slade. Oh, thank you, Siri. Um, have we really accomplished all of that? <laughs> this is a little uh, intimidating 
for a few reasons. I mean, first of all, there's this, the people that, um, but, but George uh, knows way more about my photography than I do. <laughs> so uh, to engage in a conversation is gonna be complicated, but. I am, I am actually Alex, uh, better memory double. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm, the, I'm the improved memory version of Alec. <laughs> um, and I, I still can't grow the beard. I think that some memory of childhood right. is, is uh, haunting me there. Um, indeed, I am something of a photographic archivist. Um, not with everybody, but I do have a pretty good photographic memory, despite having uh, read, seen, encountered number them in the millions by now, uh, images, not all by Alec. Um, <laughs> he works with the big camera, you know, it's very slow. Um, but uh, my sense of photography is deeply tied up in, in memories and in history. Um, and it's actually very gratifying to be sitting in this auditorium, because I have many, many memories of watching dialogues between admirable people take place up here. and. And I also like the fact that it's a bit of a cave, a little bit of a dug-in, uh, dark space. Uh, and while we were sitting here, we were watching projections of light onto the screen, which reminded me of Plato's cave and images of truth and beauty and abstraction <laughs> and ideals, um, which is one of my favorite metaphors. Um, and gosh, where was I going to go with that idea? Um, having to do with memory and, and traveling back in time and, um, and serving as Alec's uh, uh, memory, uh, helping remind him of things he probably would rather forget. Um, but in dealing with Alec, um, one, of the, one of the things that I keep coming across is that he and I have traveled some very interesting paths separate of each other. Alec is um, about eight years younger than I am, almost nine years. We were born four days apart, though. Your birthday is okay. the day before the last day of the year, and mine is the day after the first day of the year. So uh, we both have sort of okay. <laughs> semi-spectacular birthdays. I'm the 2nd of January, and Alec is the 30th of December. So, um, so we're both Capricorns, which probably has something to do with why we're both sitting here. <laughs> Just exactly what that is, I'm not sure. Um, but in, in reviewing Alec's recent work, um, I was uh, drawn to a halt, uh, a complete dead standstill, as I was looking at um, The Loneliest Man in Missouri, um, the project which is on the walls upstairs and which you've done a video on, um, to realize that, that at the heart of The Loneliest Man in Missouri, The Loneliest Man, yeah, it's not an LBM title. It's not. Ooh, interesting. Um, but at the heart of that piece is um, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. And when I was a 12th grader at high school in St. Paul, I memorized that poem. And I wish I could still re you know, recite it for you from memory, but it didn't stick that well. But as I was looking back at the poem, I, I realized how much it actually has to do with this project and with the loneliest, uh, with, uh, uh, the entire Western project and Broken Manual. And I just, uh, I know some of you have seen the movie. Um, I've just recently watched it myself. And the movie is a, is a continuing exploration of, of, uh, of proof rock. And, and just to set a scene, then I just wanted to read the last couple of uh, paragraphs from, from the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And this is reprinted in the, the booklet that's in the back of the uh, Walker's amazing catalog for the show. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince. No doubt, an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. At times, indeed, almost ridiculous. Almost, at times, the fool. I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. 
I've heard the mermaid singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I've seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed, red and brown, till human voices wake us and we drown. Wow, and good night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Yeah. That's the, we'll take a few questions now. Um, how, how did it occur to you to ask that, ask your loneliest man to read Proofrock? Right. Oh, uh, let, me, let me tell a little, give a little background for the project for those who haven't seen it. Um, I'll give a lot of background for everyone because no one would know this. But I, uh, as part of Magnum Photos, we sometimes do commissioned work and I was commissioned to photograph in Georgia the country. And um, originally, the, the idea in Georgia was that I was free to photograph whatever I wanted, to just wander around. And, um, and I actually wanted to experiment with doing this, this from here to there process again, to, which is one picture leading to the next. And right before I was about to go, they, I was told that actually they wanted me to photograph uh, the sort of, what was it, just, you know, sort of a study of minority social groups within Georgia, <laughs> which was very different. And I wasn't excited to do that, but, I, but they had this journey planned out for me, so I went on it. But I wanted to make it more uh, interesting and, and I give more of a kind of narrative thread to it. So, so I started, I, I called the project uh, The Most Beautiful Woman in Georgia. And I, and I went around the country looking for the most beautiful woman. You know, a little tongue in cheek and, uh, and, and there was, you know, an adventure and, uh, and, and I found the most beautiful woman and there's a story about what happens <laughs> and, and so forth. And, and so then I came back home and I, I was thinking about that and I wanted to do the flip side. I wanted to f find the loneliest man and, and thinking about the loneliest man, the most beautiful woman, sort of in different parts of the world. And the loneliest man in Minnesota sounded good. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like a little too obvious, and uh, he was taking the pictures. <laughs> yeah, he was taking the pictures. So yeah, uh, and I like the idea of Missouri because Missouri being in the middle of the country, and I was interested in middle-aged men and uh, middle of America, middle income, middle middle, and so I went to Missouri and started driving around and, and photographing these men in a very different way than most of my work, in, in that. Uh, I was like, you know, stalking people, not getting permission out of the car window. And <laughs> telephoto lenses. Telephoto lenses. And then, uh, and then in St. Louis, uh, I met this guy named Ed at a strip club. And he's a, he's a night nurse and spends all his free time in the strip club. Those are his only friends. And, and we went out to dinner at Ruby Tuesdays. And... And he told me that the next day was his birthday, and so that, um, and so, and he said that he didn't have family and, and, and whatnot. And so, I said, "Well, let's have a little birthday party at your place." And I hired a stripper to come to the place. So then that night, one of his favorites from the club, yeah, <laughs> right? And all of this I'd, I'd I'd photographed, but that day I thought, "Wow, this is fantastic! I, I need to get a video camera for this." And then. Uh, and I was, you know, preparing for the next day, preparing for the birthday, and I got a cake. But I also, was, and I thought about T.S. Eliot because I thought T.S. Eliot is interesting. He's from St. Louis originally. Um, there's something about it, like it all sort of, like, oh, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you memorize it in high school too? I didn't. No, oh, okay. I, I, yeah, I was barely aware of it, and I don't know where it came into my consciousness. But it, but so I went, you know, I. I drove to a Barnes and Noble and read it, and it's like, oh, this is perf you know, this is really perfect. Mm -hmm. And this idea that he reads it to her, um, mm. and he actually we did it twice, which is really incredible. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the story. And was there a question? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I'm imagining the mermaid 
and his white flannel trousers and the peach. Yeah, going and of course, off in no, directions. and the, and the, you know, I grow old, I grow old. It's like uh, that's what the work is about, and it's uh, obviously. I mean, what's what's been int of interest to me of late is this is separating men and women photographically, and um, so doing that in Georgia, doing it in Missouri, but uh, and in other projects as well. Because I definitely photograph them, photograph men and women differently. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we should jump uh, right into our first mm -hmm. uh, slide here. You wanna, okay. You want to run the? Do we do that? Yeah. Speaking of speaking of men and women, but also speaking a little bit more about about history and 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 um, how we connected or how I originally connected with you. Um, this is this is our little self-serving. Uh, you know, remember when mm -hmm. discussion. Um, but I believe that I actually, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I wrote about your work before I met you. Um, you did, I, you, I had you wrote seen the first thing about my work. Yeah. The first thing. Yeah. yeah. In all your digging, you haven't, like a teacher writing a report card or something? Wow. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the first published okay. review. Well, I wrote that about um, the show that this image behind us um, was a part of called At the Bar. And oddly enough, that setting it was a, I saw the work in December of 1995, and that was in a basement, a very dark, uh, low ceilinged uh, room called the Icebox Gallery. And Howard Christofferson is to be congratulated for having shown that work at that point. And it was like encountering undersea creatures. Um, the people who emerged out of the darkness of, of the bars that Alec photographed, and you photographed at some classic uh, mm. Minneapolis bars, maybe even St. Paul. You might have crossed the river. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but those pictures are very much about the interactions between men and women. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and, the, and the ties. And, you know, for, for a long time I looked at this picture and thought that it was, you know, the woman putting the cherry in her mouth, but that hand is actually belongs to the gentleman uh, behind her. And so the, the element of surprise is not because she's found a pit in the cherry, but she's found a cherry in going into her mouth. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, there were always surprises for me in looking at Alex's work. And... Uh, Something that appealed to me with, um, in looking at Alex's work was something that Gary Winogrand once said, which was that there's nothing as mysterious as a fact clearly described. And I think that, that mysterious facts are what have uh, characterized Alex's work pretty consistently since then. Um, the, uh, the notion of, uh, well, Gary Winogrand was a huge influence on me, maybe not so much on you, but um, one of the things I wanted to talk about here is about uh, influences and background and, and a little bit about um, who, have, who your influences have been and also maybe a little later on talk about who has been influenced by you in the sort of sense of becoming a, a mentor, a figure of, mm. of, of some esteem. But uh, before we do that, let's uh, jump Can I say one thing oh, about yeah. Winogrand? Yeah, um. no, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, because the, the the most beautiful woman in Georgia had a lot to do with Gary Winogrand. He he did a book called Women Are Beautiful, which is you know one of the stupidest names for a, a book ever ever made, and um, and, that, and a I, lot of really sort of weak pictures. Yeah, well, I, so I this I saw this book when, when I discovered photography when I was in college at Sarah Lawrence College, so it's you know former woman's college, very you know progressive, and to have this book called Women Are Beautiful, I couldn't believe it hadn't been burned. It was burned. taboo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And You didn't buy it on campus. No, no, and I, and I you know, so I, uh, I checked it out of the library, and I, and I thought it was terrible. Um, but it stayed with me. So I, the fact that it bothered me stayed mm -hmm. with me, because in fact there's something uh, just honest about what he was doing. It was totally obsessive. It yeah, was, right. You know, and he, he even admits it. He says something to the effect of, whenever I've seen a beautiful woman, I've done my, I've, I've worked hard to photograph her. I don't know if I've made a good photograph of her, but I've, right, you know, right. I've done it. And, and one of the things he pushes at, and I've seen it happen in your work, is how small a thing can be within the frame and still function as the subject of that photograph. Mm. 
um, you know, I mean, to take it to the extreme, you know, the ads in the fashion magazine where the right, 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 the product itself is almost invisible. Right. Um, so, the, the idea of that book stayed with me, and um, it, so I recently purchased it. It's quite expensive, and it and it continues to be a terrible book. Um, I think, <laughs> but but I do appreciate uh, really just uh, being honest about what you're going after like that. And, mm -hmm. um, and that lately, that's been this move that I've been making is just like going in. <laughs> right, right. I mean, the, the, the setup of the photographs in that book is anything but what we're seeing in, in this image or in the, in the next series, you know, of, from the, the portraits. Um, right. Uh, yeah, sort of things caught on the fly, you know, as though you've just seen it out of the corner of your eye, you know. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. No, it's good to bring that up. So I don't know if people are able to read this. Um, what year was this, George? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> this it almost was says, uh, 1998, I believe. OK. So this is in the Parts Journal. Which... When, when I was editing the Parts Journal for Parts Photographic Arts, um, we had a little feature called the Artist Pages. And the opportunity that, that I like to give was, you know, to say, if you had a page or two of, of the magazine, what would you do with it? How would you fill it? Um, take it and run with it. And Alec, at this point, um, I think, well, it was probably about the time of this show, uh, which was 98. And this was a show that included uh, Alec and his teacher, Joel Sternfeld, um, in a show at uh, parts photographic arts in the basement <laughs> um, sorry cave camera uh, chamber camera obscura <laughs> anyway it, it all fits together um, and so Alec uh, in re reflecting on that show you put together two of your own works and two of Joel's works that were very heavy at that time about text right okay right and I you know, kind of said, Alec, what would you do in response to that? And these were not pictures that were in the show. Right. Um, I mean, this was at a time when I was uh, working in lots of different ways. So the, the pictures in the exhibition, I mean, on this card, it, it's a picture of a sheep. And I was doing these portraits of sheep. And, um, and, then, and then I do these personal ad pictures. And I was all over, you know, the bar pictures, kind of all over the place. The headphones were part of the... Headphones were part of that. Telephones. P pilots. Yeah, there were all these different strands. And uh, hopefully in the exhibition, we, we show a few of these early pictures. and Because these strands are actually all connected for me. I see how they're connected. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, I was struggling to piece them together mm -hmm. into a body of work. But I mean, you look at at the bar, I'm, there's so many projects where I start at bars. It's just the, it's the one kind of social space that you're allowed to <laughs> work in in that way. Mm -hmm. um, these, these pictures of these, these men, you know, these lonelyish men um, with their personal ads. Um, and so, of course, the, the setup is that the text is their personal ad, and you would go and answer the ad. Right to find out what the person behind it looked like. Right, right. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, I mean, I think, you know, it's pretty obvious the loneliest man in Missouri. I mean, you can see these, right. these things running through all the, all the projects. Well, and I was interested, too, in the notion of um, using uh, popular media. I mean, this is sort of an early version of uh, Facebook, social marketing, you know, mm. or social, social media. Um, and, uh, you know, the goth project um, now involves people who you connected to through a, a what, a link serve or list serve? Uh, yeah, or, well, no, the goth was, it, there's a goth dating website so okay. that exists. Yeah. So it yeah. very much follows up on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, it, we should put the two of them together, these guys and the goths. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, uh, it's interesting the, uh, how, the development of my career has uh, it's ran parallel to the development of the internet. So you, you look at this. I was thinking about this, the parts journal. You know, that was sort of before you could ha put something on a web page, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, um, in, remember this yeah, little publication? Yeah, right. yeah. 
I mean, this is a publication that came out um, when Alec showed after his first um, McKnight Award, which he received in 1999. Um, and uh, the statement reads, Alex Soth explains that his project from here to there is, quote, in the great tradition of the photographic road trip. My road just happens to be as much in the mind as on the pavement. Um, and I wrote that Soth likens his stream of consciousness journey to internet surfing, wherein one flashing cyber interest dreamily segues into another. Mm, yeah. Um, and uh, I think that, that that idea of, of, of the instantaneous reaction to yourself, you know, following the stream of consciousness that guides you from one thing to another is, I, I've been really impressed that that's stayed a central uh, modus operandi for you. Absolutely. I mean, I think, and we all now know the thrill of web surfing and mm -hmm. image surfing in a way. And uh, But 10 years ago, we were just... Yeah, it was, it was so exciting and new. And mm -hmm. uh, But what's really great, and I encourage you to do, is do it in the real world <laughs> uh, and try to follow one thing to the next in the real world. And that's with this Walker Flickr project. That's that's what we're working towards, I think, is, uh, is mm -hmm. sort of this, this assignment to get getting people out moving in the world and then hopefully connecting these things um, so that, because it's, uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels like everything's virtual, you know, we're sitting at our desks and it, mm -hmm. like the, there really isn't a world anymore, but right. um, it's, it, it is out there, in fact. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, let's talk a little bit about connections in regard, oh, yeah, this is, this is a, this is the one picture in the group that is not by Alec, though one could imagine it having been by you. Yes, absolutely. Um, someone else who was in the 1999 Photography Fellows group um, was a fellow, uh, a fellow, uh, a friend of mine and, and an inspiration to many people named Roger Merton. And Roger uh, was, at the time, deeply immersed in photographing uh, Carnegie libraries but um, at times in his life prior, um, he was very much of a typologist in that uh, he was interested in photographing as many examples of a particular thing as he could find. And he loved the Carnegies because he knew that there were some 1,300 of them across North America, which would give him an excuse for a, an endless road trip. Um, in fact, he didn't live to complete the 1,300. I don't know the tally that he ended up with, but um, uh, Roger passed away in spring of 2001. Um, and for me, the enormity of 9-11 was uh, very, very powerful, but having lost a close friend, um, you know, the, the significance of that, I, di I didn't know anyone personally who died in the towers mm -hmm. or at the Pentagon or in the field in Pennsylvania. Um, losing someone who was of this kind of caliber, this scale of, of intellect, who I had gotten to know during his last 10 years of his life, and he had moved to Minnesota, though he still was teaching at the University of Rochester, which he thought was a great deal because it allowed him to travel back and forth, mm. passing through <laughs> Niagara, which was one of his favorite places. Mm. Um, but Roger uh, had among his topics basketball hoops um, and the color blue. Um, and when Alec at one point talked about being a McKnight Fellow, you can, I mean, he, you acknowledged Roger as someone who you had looked at. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, part of it is he uses this, this idea of typology, but uh, there was a, a very dry sense of humor attached to it. Um, and because typology that we normally think of is, is this sort of, very rigorous German photography. It's bam, bam, and I and I like the idea of using typology, but but um, playing with it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, I had this corny title. I sh shouldn't say it out loud, but I calling it lyrical typology. So, and the idea of mixing typologies together. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to take Friedlander and like shuffle them, <laughs> um, and and. And I think Merton is an example of, of doing it, but, but not in a dry way, like allowing the dog in the picture mm -hmm. um, or allowing just to connect things by the color blue, mm -hmm. um, which really opens it up. Or even the concept 
of the of blue and blues and, and absolutely yeah. yeah I mean and that was something that he was very open to and right and so then you have a picture of a woman in an interior with blue socks mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with this but you're allowed to make connections mm -hmm. between the pictures mm -hmm. and and that for me was one of the most appealing it was like this totally simple-minded thing that you did with your pictures I was like a stream of consciousness. I mean, yes, of course. Who wouldn't want to just be able to go and do whatever photograph kind of appealed to them, you know, at any given time? But you built it into the the structure of the pictures, in that right. something you know would would trigger you in the picture that you just made. Though well, I, I mean, I have a confession to make, which I've never told You've you. You lied before. to me. I have. Uh, so back in the day, you know, you apply for grants, and you have to write something when you mm -hmm. apply for a grant. You know, I'm gonna go photograph. You know, uh, Carnegie. You know, whatever. You know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You have to say what you're gonna do. And I was trying to figure out a way to not say what I was gonna do, but give an excuse for doing it. And this idea from here to there mm. was a was a way to get away with it. And then I would also quote Robert. Oh, I knew that. Yeah, yeah, I know you knew. But <laughs> it's not right through that. But I would quote Robert Frank's uh, Guggenheim application. That sort of says the same thing. It's uh, I forget the language of it, but it's, it's like I want to continue in the same vein. Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, and he doesn't say stream of consciousness, but it's like that. And then it gives he makes a list of things that he'll potentially photograph. Mm -hmm. And so I used him as an example, and then this idea from here to there, and it sounded legit. Mm -hmm. And then I, although it, at <laughs> one point you made a diagram. You, you I drew did. a little diagram, right, right, and that really alienated people. Oh, did it? it like, yeah, yeah. oh, he's he's got this all planned out. Right, right, right. I think that was the '98 application. It was. And then '99, <laughs> right, got rid of the diagram. Perfect. That was it. But I mean, the interesting thing about this, so I, so this structure of from here to there, that was the first. That was the first way that I could pull these strands together from all from the sheep and the pilots and the this and that. Uh -huh. um, and then, eventually, I just turned it into the Mississippi River. I just, uh, it's, the same, it's really the same project. Mm -hmm. but I, th and then it, was, it worked better, because it's before, when it's, it's, it's a little gimmicky when you say from here to there. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, Mississippi River, it's, it does something else. And everyone can kind of hang on to that line. Well, it, it taps into a whole different mythos. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, the next picture. Um, is, well, sort of a part of the project, though it didn't come out in the book, right? Didn't come out in the book, um, but it's, yeah, it's absolutely part of the project. Um, this is a photograph of William Eggleston, and during one of, one of those from here to there trips that became Sleeping by the Mississippi, um, I just showed up at Eggleston's house. And Eggleston, you know, kind of haunts everything that I do. <laughs> um, and he's, I mean, these influences loom large in different ways. And, and in most cases, like, like my teacher, Joel Sternfeld, I just decided, I, you know, I acknowledge the influence and I just like move through it. Eggleston's a little different where like I'm actually sort of fighting with Eggleston in an imaginary way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> about his way of working um, and trying to find my own path, so. Mm -hmm. No one really understands how Eggleston influences them. Mm. I, think, I think he has one of the most complicated uh, approaches. I mean, certainly not formally he hasn't influenced you because you're working in entirely different uh, right. uh, film sizes and, right. and you know, speeds of operation. Um, but that whole concept of photographing democratically, you know, that you've wrestled with, that he seems to have a, uh, a kind of mm, very tight grip on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and that you explored in that delightful video with uh, Walking with Misha, uh, Still Life, no, uh, still, I was going to say Still Life with Labradoodle, but... The Democratic Labradoodle. The Democratic Labradoodle, right. Yeah. Yeah, so if you go into the galleries, um, you'll, you'll see this picture, and you, uh, which was made 10 plus years ago. And then there's a much more recent little video I made where I revisited Eggleston's home and made this, this walk 
photographing sort of in the style of Eggleston, thinking about Eggleston, thinking about his influence. Um, and and I guess this relate to this issue I do this issue of like what do you hang the pictures on? What's the structure? Is is the thing I'm always battling with. And so typology gives you this one structure, mm -hmm. but it's for me it's too rigid. And so and then someone like Eggleston is without structure, apparently. It's just moving through the world seeing, mm -hmm. which is a really innocent and wonderful thing, but somehow for me, particularly now in the age of Flickr and all of that, I, I need more, or for myself, I need more. And lately, I've been trying to hang it, hang the pictures on these little stories, these little story arcs. Mm -hmm. But it really, uh, this is always the battle, is, and the game, is finding how to bring the pictures together. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I liked about, about this photograph of Eggleston is a couple of things. A, he's not photographing. He's dealing with a completely different medium that mm -hmm. he's also very committed to, but um, music and sound. And the other is that you're, you've backed out of the room. Hmm. You're leaving the room. You know, you're, you're letting the master be in his own workspace and you know, moving through the blue door and, and moving away. I don't know what was happening at that moment. That might have been just how you saw him. No, I mean, I'll tell you a funny story about this, uh, that... You know, so this is my big day. I actually meet this, this legend who I wanted to meet, and I get to spend the whole day with him. And it was dreamy, but I, so I wanted to take his picture. And so I, I moved this chair out onto this veranda and set it up. <laughs> and set up the camera, everything was focused so it could be done quickly. And he wouldn't go out there. You know, and, and uh, I don't know if it's he didn't want to be portrayed as a southerner because it kind of looked southern out there. That was a loaded chair, yeah. I don't know if he didn't like it because it was too set up. Um, so I was forced to make this picture, which was an 8x10 camera, like doing it on the fly, things moving, him not stopping for me was really challenging. Mm -hmm. So it's consequently, it's this incredibly complicated picture, unlike what I would normally do. But it's mm -hmm. partly what I love about it. Mm -hmm. And it, but it also, to me, it, it represents this contest as well. Like, he's not coming to sit in my chair, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> well, he's, he, you know, he's, you're showing him with his shoulder up, you know, in mm -hmm. an almost defensive posture. Yeah. I mean, and he's sitting on a box of ammunition, for what it's worth. <laughs> so it's... Another loaded chair. Yes. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <laughs> I mean, didn't he actually suggest to you? That, uh, sorry. Yeah, just, no, it's, it's part of the Slade package. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think my father's here. I, I have him to thank for that. Yeah. Um, uh, but I didn't, didn't, didn't Bill say, "Oh, this is where you should photograph me" or something? I, I, I you, you know better few, than I do. Few bourbons down the line there. He was a few bourbons down the line. He was, but yeah. Um, Anyway, that, uh, the next picture, I think, for me, really marks yourself. I mean, this, this is you, I feel, in, a, in really setting your, your tripod legs down. I mean, it's saying, <laughs> you know, this is a picture that I have not really spent a lot of time looking for art historical precedent, but, but you'd probably have to go to, you know, religious icon painting to mm. find, you know, deep resonance for this, but in a very modern way. I mean, and I know you have, there's, there's an amazing tale about this, and you know, when you tell the tale, it'll, it'll help explain why this is a very new picture. But this is always the question is, do you tell the tale? And yeah. it's... Uh, oh, maybe you shouldn't. No, this is something that it's Hands? in the exhibition. Uh, 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 and I, I, I never have the answer for this, so... Uh, I mean, in the exhibition, you see, I mean, in, in the Mississippi room, I don't know what it is, maybe 15 pictures or something like that. You don't see all of Sleeping by the Mississippi, and you have these like direct encounters with the pictures, and, and not a lot of text information. There's certainly not a story on the wall. Maybe you can call your cell phone and get the story. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, um, but that's one way to experience it. And then the book is another way where you can connect all the pictures. But in the back of Sleeping by the Mississippi, and I did this in Niagara as well, you can often find the stories behind the pictures. 
but I'm always struggling. Do I put it next to it? Do I put it behind? You know, so I did this new body of work, Broken Manual, and just earlier today we saw the making of <laughs> Broken Manual, where you get suddenly all the stories, mm -hmm. and which is wonderful, but I'm always separating the two and never knowing if I should tell or if I shouldn't. And, and, and lately what I've been doing is really telling stories. And uh, just so in this New York Times Opinionator blog, I did a, I, Adeline and I revisited each other Again, ten this years. is Adeline. Oh, yeah, sorry, Adeline. Uh, she she now uh, lives in Texas, and she emailed me out of the blue uh, because she never got a print of this picture because she was in this roving band of like uh, jugglers or something <laughs> and didn't have an address. And uh, but now she's she's going to to college in uh, Austin, and but she was coming back. She told me that she was coming back to Mardi Gras ten years later, so I, I revisited her and, and rephotographed her, hmm. um, which is is of course its own little story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you have to. You, oh, I have just, to tell the story. Yeah, yes, no, no. I mean, <laughs> no. I mean, so the story is. Uh, We're all waiting. Right. So you so you go down the Mississippi River. I mean, you sort of have to. You have to do Mardi Gras, but Mardi Gras is this horrible thing to photograph because everyone's photographing it and it's just full of cliches and um, so I was more interested in photographing the next day Ash Wednesday and kind of when the city's quiet and you know hung over and um, and so then I went I went down to the cathedral and was was looking for people with ashes on their forehead and and I asked to take her if I could take her picture and she said will you buy me a beer and uh, this is normally <laughs> not what you do on <laughs> Ash right, Wednesday. Right, on Ash uh, Wednesday, you're supposed to put everything away. Uh. And I said that to her, and she said, oh, it was like she didn't, she'd forgotten that she'd put cigarette ashes on her forehead. So she was not a real uh, religious person. However, she now goes to a Catholic university mm -hmm. in Austin, um, mm -hmm. and things have changed. So, but I was, I, that, that little detail was really wonderful for me. Um, mm -hmm. But do you put it in? Do you put it in there? I don't. I never know. Photography so much is about the allowing viewers to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when you made this picture, I, I, I don't. We've never talked about it very much, but I, I do feel like it just sort of sets a stake in the in the ground. It says, you know, from here forward is is me. <laughs> um. Maybe it was the whole process of that that project. I mean, maybe it's hard to single out one. No, picture. there. I mean, it did. A lot of things did come together because it, for me, it does represent. I mean, there is that from here to there quality where I'm floating to get to this picture in a way, um, but then it is a self-contained photograph mm -hmm. where, and hopefully you can experience this in the gallery where there's a lot of detail, and um, I mean, what I love about portraiture is that. You have this physical, you know, encounter with a person, as you know, imagining I could freeze you and just you know stare up your nostrils right now, you know. <laughs> um, but there's something really great about being able to do that, mm -hmm. and and that, and just allowing the photograph to just be that. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember the big prints uh, from the. I mean, this was this was on the cover of the the McKnight brochure, and the opportunity to stare at this picture was. Was profound. I mean, this picture and, and Kim at the Polish Palace, um, you know, just these, just really strikingly simple in some ways, but in, incredibly profound in terms of symbolic implications and some of the narrative as well. And you know, the the idea of one picture having a sort of consonance, a, a connection to another, you know, that that isn't just about a kind of exterior reality, but something that links you, that, that follows your blood or DNA from one to the other. Well, one of the things I also, I, I, was, I learned around this period of time was that, um, that there is nothing more mysterious than a fact cl clearly described. So you can just photograph the thing itself very simply and there can be so much that you can read into it and, and so much meaning attached to it mm -hmm. and that you don't have to, um, 
you know, do 19 different things to a picture. And that's something that I've, I've gotten better and better at, or worse and worse at, depending on how you look at it. But it was just stripping out the picture and leaving very little there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't have to load it up so much. What was the next picture? Uh, then we jumped to Niagara. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes, I don't know if we should really mention this, but um, Niagara is sometimes referred to between us guys as the penis project. <laughs> right. Um, maybe we should just let that one uh, <laughs> hang. Uh, God. <laughs> did I say something irreverent? Maybe dangle? No. Um, when when Alec and I were talking about this about this particular uh, phallocentric view of the project, um, I was I was put in mind of a picture that that Alfred Stieglitz made in uh, 1923, and it was called Spiritual America. And, and the picture is of, I'm sorry we don't have it up on the screen, but um, we might not have been able to find it in, in short order, but it's of the traces and hindquarters of a gelded stallion. Um, and I sort of thought about that as looking at this, well, maybe there's a connection. Um, but uh, throughout, throughout Niagara, there's a, there's a sense of, of the desire to do something with that member. Um, yeah. <laughs> the desire to, to, you know, to, to link, to couple. And for me, the most powerful pictures in the series um, are the pictures of couples, the, the couples without clothes on, and the spaces that they create between them. I mean, there are some that are just completely interwoven, mm -hmm. and then there's one just amazing picture of a young woman at the left side of the frame and the man on the right side of the frame, and she is just like leaning through this space, but 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 it holds, you know. Mm. It's like how it, they're unclothed, they're sharing space together, but there's still this loneliness. Right. And I mean, the the, the penis project thing is not a joke. It's uh, I mean, every one of those nude couples, it's sort of the man is exposed, the woman's not. Mm -hmm. And in that picture, where there's a gap. Very few people have ever commented on this, but uh, there's a television. And there's an advertisement, I think, for string cheese. <laughs> and it's, but it's over and over again. It, this is, um, and, but this, this was intentional at a certain point where it's like instead of basketball hoops and, and the color blue, it was penises. Mm. And, and the work itself really had to do with, the, you know, that like surge of passion and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the instantaneous reaction yeah. as a photograph. Yeah, and it was a play on Niagara and Viagra, and um, mm -hmm. but but really the idea of wh why do you go to a, a really powerful waterfall to celebrate new love? Right. Well, as Oscar Wilde said, what Niagara is the first uh, great disillusionment of the right. American married life. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, I know, Alec, that, that you went to Niagara not just searching for penises, but um, <laughs> in fact, what, what you were looking for was one of those intangibles. I mean, that notion of love and what does love look like and what, what is connection truly. Um, and I think it was the first time that you started collecting letters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the next image is, is one of the letters that, that you collected. Um, you probably know the text by yeah, heart. Well, if there was a nice apartment and I have a decent job and you felt happy and thought there could be a nice history together, would you come home? Yeah. Page number two, that's it. Page number two. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I mean, the thing about simplicity and a fact clearly described, you know, one thinks of Walker Evans and just, photographing, you know, just a house and just looking at it. And then Walker Evans would just collect a sign. Mm -hmm. And really, you almost don't need the picture anymore. It's just the thing. Mm -hmm. And I got to this point where, yeah, the letter, like that to me is as beautiful as any photograph I can take. I actually like the smudges and stuff on it. Um, and this is, when I say I'm stripping things down, this is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. It's just things 
are so charged at times. Mm -hmm. um, but with Niagara, I wanted to, you know, I was dealing with love and stuff, but photography is limited in what it can do. You can't hear voices, so this is a way to get voices within the project. Mm -hmm. But then you started actually having people bring other things into pictures. I mean, texts became more important both in the staging of pictures and sometimes within them. I'm thinking about the project that you did for Granta uh, of the, oh, right. the workers' right, right. project. Yeah, you always remember these things. Um, <laughs> no, so over and over there's been, there's, I mean, it's like I, there's this yearning this for, there's literary aspiration, <laughs> failed literary <laughs> aspiration behind all of the projects and it's, there's a desire for text and that's, that's that same desire to tell the story behind the picture. But with Sleeping by the Mississippi, a, a big part of the working process was having people write down what their dreams are on a sheet of paper. And those got edited out. Uh, with this exhibition, we, we thought about having those sheets of paper in. They got edited out again. Mm -hmm. um, but following up on that, I, yeah, I did this project for Granta magazine. Um, at a metal stamping plant in Minnesota. And I asked people to write down what they think about while they're sitting at the metal stamping machine all day. And, you know, and that led to, the, to with Mississippi, the love letters, and, and often wanting to hear voices and, mm -hmm. and tie things together. Mm -hmm. The video's been a way for you to, I mean, the like New York Times videos and the yeah, short videos yeah. that you've been creating. Yeah, so... Uh, I mean, I, I always say photography is not good at telling stories. It's good at suggesting stories. But I, but I think that one can experiment. Well, first of all, the book form, maybe there's an opportunity to tell stories. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Um, but definitely online, there's this whole new way to connect images and sound and text. And so I'm experimenting with it. I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and, yeah, I'm just trying it out. Well, I, I love the fact that there are people responding to the New York Times stories and saying, why did I just waste eight minutes of my life? Well, except it's uh, usually two minutes. Well, yeah, they, is... they exaggerate. <laughs> I, mean, but, um, I think we may have one more. This is the last, this is the last image? It's the last image, yeah. Um, and, and I include it because I, I just find it completely fascinating. <laughs> I mean... I don't. I don't even want to know the story in some ways. <laughs> you know, it, it no, just it, appeals it, to me as, it, and it's part of the recent the recent work. Yeah. Um, and and I should say the recent work. So it's called Broken Manual, and if you go to the exhibition, um, there's a there's a sheet when you walk in that you can pick up with the titles, and I think the title of this one is probably. 2007 XL 005632, but a couple of them actually give information. Oh, I but think it's actually 33. Three. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Uh, but I, I really, I leave out so much information um, mm -hmm. and sort of forcing people to, to put it together or not themselves. It's, it's broken. That's mm -hmm. why. Mm -hmm. Broken man, you all. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Less be more, son. <laughs> oh, let's not get started. Let's not um, get started. It is now time for us to uh, welcome a few questions yes. from the audience. Absolutely. And I know that somewhere out there there are microphones uh, floating around. So if you would all be so kind as to uh, wait until a microphone lands in your hand before um, asking questions. Uh, Alec will be happy to uh, entertain with answers, I hope. A whole bunch in the middle there. Early on today, you mentioned that um, you separate men and women and you photograph them differently. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how you photograph them differently. Uh, yeah, and I, uh, I didn't realize this. It, it was uh, when I had an exhibition at the at the MIA, the, just a portraits exhibition, and there was a, a critic who talked about how I photograph men and women differently, and I was like, "Oh, really?" 
and then, uh, and then it's so obvious that I do. Um, and I mean, it's. I think it's it's pretty easy to say that I see more of myself in, in men, and so I often there's a little more humor to those pictures and uh, um, whatnot. And then um, you know, and often with women, it's sort of, it's a little bit a little bit the other, and um, I don't know what else to say, but. But it's just I, you know, I, f you know, it's very clear to me when I'm photographing that I, that I'm attracted to something else. I mean, often there's this question of why, how do you choose who to photograph? And I'll tell you a funny story where I, uh, a few months ago, I was teaching for a week in Hartford, Connecticut, and I, and I was asked that question: Who do you choose to photograph? How do you choose? And I. And there was a class of maybe 30 people, and I said, "Well, I, yeah, and I don't know how to do it, but you know, I wouldn't want to photograph any one of you except for you, you know." And I oh. and I did that, and was really amazing is that I mean, we didn't know each other. It was the first day. Yeah. The end of the class, uh, he presented his work, and it was on. I mean, the his presentation. He was you know really nervous, um, but it was. He'd, he'd done this project where he was hiding in the back of a station wagon, photographing, and Ooh, wow. and he was really, you know, and he he's really uh, uh, not afraid to be voyeuristic, um, and it just it was hmm. it was really interesting that I was drawn to that persona, mm -hmm. um, and that's over the years I've become, you know, I'm just aware of how I'm attracted to people, and in different ways for different qualities, yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question? Um, I'm, I was really drawn to The Loneliest Man in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering with Ed, did he know the title of what you were doing? And how did he feel about being portrayed as that lonely man? Did he feel like it described him? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting uh, because, the, you know, in photographing other people, there are always these big ethical issues. And I think I've normally been pretty, you know, pretty good. And then with that work recently, I've, I've gone to the dark side a little bit. <laughs> and with Ed, uh, I've since seen him again on a different trip to Missouri and delivered a, a picture to him and... Um, and he's surprisingly okay with everything, I think. But it, um, but it's, I mean, there's something awkward about the whole business, for sure. Mm. And there's, I mean, I always say there's something really, uh, you know, it's strange because I'm, you know, doing my little art project, but I'm, you know, other people and other lives are involved, and it's, uh, it's, it's strange. Well, you, you know what Arbus said about photographing people. I mean, she said that... Um, that people love to be paid attention to, and photographing them is a reasonable way of paying attention. Well, and this is absolutely true. I mean, there, for, all, I mean, for all these dark ethical questions. I mean, so many people love it, and yeah, love the the mm -hmm. attention, and and so often it's uh, we have a real connection. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting in the film when you dealt with Garth, and you were struggling with how to represent him and the whole sort of transcendent experience you had mm. with him. Anyway. Yeah. Other questions? There's one, a couple down here. Um, speaking of paying attention, do you pay your subjects or share any of the uh, proceeds? proceeds? <laughs> uh, I almost never pay. There's been... I mean, there have been a few times where I've paid, and for example, in the picture of of Ed and Blaze, the stripper, I I paid Blaze, and uh, that was to be the guest, though, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 right. Um, uh, but in terms of proceeds, no, no. Uh, we just saw the documentary, and it was just terrific. We thought, um, 
when you had the journey and followed your nose, so to speak, um, part of it was your own personal quest to have freedom and independence. And as you completed the journey, did you feel that you had a, enough need met via the, the trip for you, that you could go home and feel more like, I've had my trip, or did it encourage you to want more independence and more freedom as a person? Well, the thing, I mean, the thing about it is it's not an attainable thing. So it's, I mean, there is, the reason, the work is called Broken Manual, and, and the book itself is, is constructed like a manual on how to run away from your life, but it's broken because it doesn't work because you can't actually run away from your life. And the people that I meet, uh, you know, sometimes I found them on the internet. So, you know, the, the people are always connected to other people, and there, it just exists as an ideal. So, no. So I come home, and uh, you know, and I have a beautiful, wonderful family, and all that. And then, but I fantasize about my treehouse. You know, <laughs> still. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean, I I love the fact that what you're what you're working towards is is finding a way to image that ephemerality, the idea of escape. Right, exactly. That, that for me is the, that was the whole problem with this project is, it's, it's kind of like, I would say, I'm not photographing the Mississippi River, it's the idea of wandering around the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. And I'm not photographing people retreating, I'm photographing the desire to retreat. And it's mm -hmm. like, how do you picture desire? Mm -hmm. It's invisible. Right. That's why I should have been a writer. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, maybe. Over here, I think there's a question. Hi. Uh, you said that most people have been very um, happy with the attention that your camera has, has your focus on them. But I'm wondering if there have been other instances where maybe you've captured um, a, a vulnerability or an embarrassment and um, people have, have regretted the participation or um, regretted it years later. Uh, so far, so good for the most part. Um, I mean, the one, the interesting story, I think, and it relates to the exhibition, is there's a photograph of a nude couple in the Niagara series that's in the show, it's a heavy set couple. And I, you know, I made the picture, and they came home from the trip, and I got an email from the woman saying, uh, Michelle saying, you know, I think I made a mistake. I think, you know, I, I, I you know, I crossed over in some line, and I, um, I don't, I don't want this picture out in the world. And, and we had a long series of exchanges where I, I said, and I, and I encourage you to look at the picture this way because a lot of people go in the gallery, they chuckle at it or whatever. But if you actually look at it, um, it's a very tender picture, and and you can tell that she's sort of scared, and that her husband is protecting her, and. Um, and that's what I said. It's a really beautiful picture of that moment. And what was interesting, so they, they allowed me to use it. And then I had this show in New York, and they actually came. It was the first time that ever happened, where they came. They'd never been to New York. They came there. They were there the whole night. And it was really great and positive. Um, so for the most part, they've been good experiences. Um, look, ap after having seen the film um, prior to this, um, I know that you said that the work is about the desire to retreat, but at least looking at some of the subjects, it seems like they also had a strong desire to be retrieved. And hmm. um, I wondered how that mm. figures into it. Uh, well, I think, it's, I think it's totally what it's about, is that, yeah, is that, um, Uh, you want to get away. I mean, my... Hmm, Got to be careful not to say too much in front of a crowded <laughs> audience. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, for example, the work in... Uh, just to keep switching gears, the work in Niagara was done, you know, after sleeping by the Mississippi, and suddenly I'd, uh, I was traveling, but I had a fan... You know, I had a child... And home, so this like romance of this the Mississippi and wandering was different. There was this pull home, and that's a, a lot of the work had to do with that. And I think, I think, 
your home and you, and you desire a retreat, and then you're retreating and you desire connection to other people. And, and that's absolute, that's, that's why it doesn't work, <laughs> is that you need other people. Yeah. Uh, at, the, yep. at the beginning, I, I keep thinking about this, you were talking about the book, Women Are Beautiful. And at least twice you said the book is a terrible book, and I want to know what's terrible about it. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I, I mean, <laughs> it's just he really, I mean, he really likes large breasts. I mean, that's, and that is like, that's pretty much the conceptual basis of the book. It's <laughs> <laughs> The, 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 driving, the driving force of that book is, is lust. And, yeah. and lust can make things seem a lot closer than they were in reality. Um, and one's imagination covers a lot of space that your camera maybe hasn't. Um, and Alec realized that you know to get close is to improve the density of the picture, excuse me. Um, and uh, the, the pictures in that book are not, it's like the picture editing wasn't good, or, or, but, the, but as an overall conceptual piece, it comes across. I mean, it is about obsession overcoming one's aesthetics. Right, you know? yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's good. One's ability to function in a normal way as a, as a sane photographer. <laughs> Though Winogrand's sanity was sometimes in question. John, what's uh, this oh, guy over here? Down there. This is my collaborator, John no, Gossage. No. Hi, John. <laughs> I, I was just interested if you thought uh, uh, Broken Manual is done. Absolutely, it's done. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I. Uh, it, it's interesting because it's in. Uh, so I, I'm sorry for people that didn't see the film because I hate to reference it when people didn't see it. But um, the the filmmakers accompanied me on three different trips, and on the last trip, I barely took any pictures at all because I, I was I just wanted to find a cave, and I was kind of done photographing. And um, and I, I've yeah I've I've really moved on where where this, that work is so fragmentary, and now I need to pull things together and have tighter lines connecting things. So I, f I feel very much that it's done, yeah. Mm -hmm. Up there. Alex, going forward, what are your projects and personal goals? Uh -huh. uh, Is that uh, your dad? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's talk later, dad. Let's, let's So the projects, uh, I mean, one of the things that I really want to do, and with this exhibition, too, is, uh, is break down the idea that I'm just, I just do 8x10, you know, large format portraits or whatever, you know, whatever it is, and that I'm interested in, in the struggle of connecting pictures. And um, so, and I feel like if Broken Manual is sort of this novel, uh, uh, of a sort, and that now I want to do a series of short stories and just practice with different ways of connecting pictures in short stories. And, and so, The Loneliest Man in Missouri is a little short story. Hmm. Are, uh, the, are the zines in general leaning in that direction? There's some of that, yeah. And so, this little publishing thing I've got called Little Brown Mushroom um, has now morphed into this idea of children's books, like little golden books and using the, the children's book as a template for how to combine pictures and text. And so the, the first one that we really did was Trent Park. It was called Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. And it's, it's done, yeah, sort of like a children's book. And, and for me, it's like trying to find a model to tell stories you know, and combine image and, and, and story. Well, you have a, an actual youthful collaborator on one of the projects, right? Carmen's project? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I, I mean, this this is very much related to everything. But so my daughter, Carmen, uh, seven, is uh, did did a project with me in England recently, where we were there, 
I was I was doing a commission project and and had visa problems and was forbidden from working. And so my solution was to have my daughter take all the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this was very much uh, also an experiment in, uh, in, in thinking about Eggleston and photographing democratically because she photographed democratically. I mean, she's, she took 2,000 pictures and... With but, the A-10. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but also, you know, she doesn't have cliches in, in her head, so she doesn't photograph the sunset. She photographs, you know, her shoes. Mm -hmm. And and magical, really fantastic pictures. And, and, and so and was, what I like about this work is that there is a story about how she comes to make it, and then it's also like dealing with these photographic issues. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the short stories, yeah. Mm -hmm. How are the child labor laws in? I know. <laughs> That's next. I know. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering um, if you get model releases signed uh, by your subjects, and um, when you're in these really vu vulnerable moments when people are putting themselves out there, does this legal document suddenly change the whole uh, mood and, and scope? Yeah. Uh, I almost always get model releases, but not for th not yep yeah, not for uh, some of these projects. These the, the things like the loneliest man, but most things I get model releases, but I use a one sentence release form, um, which probably wouldn't cover me in any court of law, but it's, it's just a way to say they acknowledged it. And I do try to send people copies of the pictures. Any more? There's a question right here. Big finale. I have, I have one. Oh, you have one. Yeah, yeah. I hate to be responsible for the big finale, but okay. <laughs> um, there, there's been a number of threads connecting the conversations from earlier and now, and um, I'm wondering if you can just comment on this, but you made a distinction um, with respect to the film about personal work versus social documentary. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that is a hallmark even of social documentary is that everybody photographs from where they are. So you approach women differently from men because you're a man. And you're interested in the experience of um, middle-aged men, although I don't think you're quite there yet, are you? Um, because, you know, that's sort of the milieu you see yourself as a part of. So it seems to me that um, there's a, a kind of honesty that comes from photographing from where you are and looking at what you can truly understand or at least search for what you can you know, understand, something that means something to you. So I guess the, it's not really a question but sort of a uh, sort of invitation to response to dialogue in the sense that social documentary is not that different. Uh, right, social right, right. documentarians are pursuing ideas that they're passionate about, that they care about, and they do it from where they sit. Not sit, but you know where they stand. Mm -hmm. It's better. Um, so, do you really shy away from that term? Do you, do you feel like you need to shy away from that term? Is it important to say, well, this is personal as opposed to social documentary, which mm -hmm. I think you know are not actually that different? No, I mean it's. Uh I mean, there's a gradation of steps in between, and um, I guess, yeah, I often like to to just point to it because, you know, especially with something like the Mississippi River, you know, there's an expectation that I'm going to be documenting life on the river, and you know, and like, and you know, the commerce of St. Louis and this and that, and I'm not interested in those things. And um, so it's just sort of making it clear that, you know, I'm, I'm interested in my own stuff, and I'm not, I'm not doing a, I'm not doing science, you know. But at the same time, I, you know, I realize it's not, you know, poetry either. It's somewhere in between. Um, well, we're pretty much at the end of our allotted time. I did want to ask you: Have you ever photographed a wedding? Yeah, not only have I photographed a wedding, uh, last night, 
two, there were yeah two different couples. Well, there's one couple right up there, who's I photographed. There, that, that was the last wedding I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> but How'd they turn out? They're pretty good. Really good. Okay. They're pretty good. Yeah. So How, absolutely. Was yeah. that like 15 years ago or no? Yeah. 10 years ago. Okay. Not that long. Yeah. Um, thank you, Alec. Um, we are you, we are really gifted and blessed to be Minnesotans. Um, I say this because I'm now living in Boston, and I know increasingly how true it is. Um, to be from the middle of the country gives you perspective. Um, to be from the middle of the country helps you appreciate long distances in cars. Um, and the fact that Alec could go and work in New York or work in Los Angeles, but chooses to stay here in Minnesota, I think, is part and parcel of the art um, that he makes. Uh, so. Um, I, it's a great thing that the Walker has decided to take on this project of surveying the work because here it is and we in Minnesota really do have a unique ability to see the richness of your work. So thank you to the Walker. Thank you, Alec. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. You.